Uh, great. So um, uh, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Thomas Aldous. I'm speaking to you today um, about um, serverless post GIS. Um, and so I, I first spoke about um, uh, serverless post GIS at Phosphor G UK in Edinburgh. I think it was almost a year ago now, maybe not quite. Um, and since then, uh, we at Address Cloud have started using um, some tooling to run this in production. Um, and so uh, we just wanted to kind of share with you today our experience of doing that and, and kind of give a bit of demo of, of how, you, how easy it is to set up um, a PostGIS database using this technology um, and also show kind of some example applications um, to get people thinking about it. So, um, yeah, next slide, great. So an overview of the, of the demo slash presentation. Um, I'm gonna give you context, um, you know, why do we need a serverless database? Um, I'm gonna dive into um, this technology from Amazon called Aurora Serverless for Postgres um, and have a look at that. I'm gonna show you a really quick whistle stop tour of how you'd set up um, a demo. Um, and we talk about security, VPCs, uh, and database access. So once you've got your database set up, how do you how do you access it? Um, and give you a demo of um, of uh, connecting to the database using QGIS. Um, we'll also take a look at the data API, which is an, um, some technology from Amazon that allows you to connect to uh, a database without um, actually managing Postgres connections. And I'll show a working example of that um, using some serverless um, vector tiles. So serving vector tiles from the database from PostGIS to the That was odd. So uh, I just had a little message there saying the host muted everybody. Um, so uh, hoping that's working um, for you all now. So uh, let's dive in without further ado. Um, let's look at context. So why do we need a serverless database? Um, so at Address Cloud, we provide um, geocoding, property intelligence, um, and geographic perils information to customers um, here in the UK, uh, countries in Europe, um, and um, North America. We work um, with the in, uh, insurance market, uh, we work with financial services, um, and we also work with um, delivery companies to do logistics planning. So um, for those of you in the UK, if you get an organic, or England and Wales, if you get um, an organic vegetable box from Riverford Organics, um, when you put in your address, um, that, that's coming to our service, it's coming to Address Cloud to um, find the location for um, dropping off your organic fruit and veg. Um, and so we use um, best in breed data, for example, from Ordnance Survey, we use address-based premium so that that delivery driver can get, um, really get to the front door of that property. And so we have a large number of transactions um, every month, but what we see is that our um, variability in the number of transactions that we're performing is highly scalable. Um, we can see that um, insurers coming on and just wanting to understand the risk to say flooding um, for all of the properties in their um, portfolio. So they would push it through a big, big batch through our API um, to, to geocode and then, and then uh, risk assess those locations. So you can see we've got this really spiky um, uh, set of transactions that's occurring um, on our system. Um, and so we need to be able to deal with that. Traditionally, we would um, you know, have some sort of fixed capacity if we're running our own servers or even our own virtual servers, um, we'd have some capacity. Maybe we'd set up scaling rules to buy or purchase time on more servers um, in response to um, demand. And that kind of requires us um, either uh, ahead of time estimating what our peaks are going to be and our troughs are going to be, and also configuring and keeping an eye on those scaling rules. What serverless gives us is um, we effectively hand off um, some of that uh, we hand off for, um, some of that um, management to our service provider, in this case, Amazon Web Services, um, and they provide that capacity and the scaling um, of that um, service for us. So we can just keep making requests and, and the service scales horizontally. Um, and I spoke about this at Fosfor G in Edinburgh and I've written about it. Um, if you go to blog.addresscloud.com, you can see some posts that I've written about this there. Um, and so last year, we, you know, we'd really just started um, playing with this and, and now we're kind of using uh, this in production. 
do about 11 million transactions a month, give or take. Um, not all of those come to Postgres, Postgres. Um, a subset of those queries are where we need to do, we need to do geographic lookups. So um, if you've got an arbitrary site like a school or a hospital, uh, maybe an insurer wants to see the flood risk for that whole site. So they're drawing an arbitrary polygon around it um, and sending that to us. And um, that's when we fall back on, on using PostGIS as opposed to one of our other data stores. And that's when we need to be able to deal with these, um, these complex queries and also spikes in demand. So um, taking a quick look at Aurora serverless for Postgres, um, this uh, diagram pinch from the Amazon documentation and the links at the bottom. And really kind of the, the things to understand here are that um, what Amazon have done is they've, they've created a database called um, Aurora and it has a mode of operation called serverless, which provides you with a, a Postgres compatible um, database environment. So um, it's, it's not the same as setting up your own existing um, Postgres database uh, on a virtual machine or even using Amazon's um, relational database service system. Because what they do is they actually separate the data storage layer, which is uh, these green, um, uh, green circles down here at the bottom, um, from the compute um, layer, which is the, the layer that performs queries against the database. So your um, data is stored and um, is sharded across uh, lots of different, very fast, uh, high availability redundant disks. Um, uh, across state, Amazon's data centers and then you have this compute capacity which is these blue squares that allows you to query that data and as you as uh, more and more people make queries of the system as queries um, tax those, uh, those compute layers um, then more compute um, capacity will be added um, and, and Amazon manages that um, connection pool for you using their proxy fleet and then you have your application layer at the top um, so it's quite a different way of thinking about how um, the database operates so um, just kind of some features and key constraints and we'll dive in and take a look at how we'd set, set something up. Um, so the features are um, the database scales horizontally um, uh, in terms of compute. So you can run lots of queries on, your, on the same data and you can run um, as many queries as you want uh, almost. The data store is high availability and has redundancy. Um, so you don't really have to worry about losing your data. Um, uh, the database is secured in a virtual private cloud, um, which is good because it keeps your data safe, but is also um, quite um, nuanced in terms of connecting to it. And it's something that we're going to have a look at today. Um, currently, um, the serverless mode for Aurora supports Postgres 10.7 and PostGIS 2.4. So constraints to consider when you're using this um, are the time to scale. So as you uh, ask for more capacity from that compute layer, um, uh, you, you, Amazon, there is, a, there is a latency there as more compute capacity is added. So, um, uh, you, you know, you may be waiting up to 10 to 60 seconds for more compute capacity to be added. Um, you can actually configure the database to scale to zero. So, if, so this is great for your developer databases that perhaps aren't being used on evenings or weekends um, because you're not um, paying for compute capacity when you're not using it. But when you come to the office or when you come to your home office on Monday morning and make your coffee, that first query that you hit the database with, um, it's, going to take, it's going to take 10 to 60 seconds to get some results back um, whilst that compute layer warms up. Um, the database isn't publicly accessible, it's in a VPC and unlike other database offerings from Amazon, you can't access the database from outside that VPC and we'll look at some, we'll look at some ways around that shortly. You've got limited version support, so only the versions that are here on the screen, Postgres 10.7 and Postgres 2.4 are available currently. Um, there's no easy pathway to mitigate, uh, to migrate, sorry, your data from existing databases. Um, so, so loading data in is a, is a bit of a, a slow process. Um, and you're also, um, currently Amazon doesn't guarantee that serverless offering um, through an SLA, a service level agreement. So they're not um, guaranteeing you um, a specific period of uptime. And we'll have to talk about our experience of that as well. So with those kind of constraints in mind, um, I think it's good to, there's a lot of benefits, but it's good to understand um, the potential issues. So let's have a look here at how we would set up um, a database. I just kind of want to show how easy it is to do. Um, let's go let's find the right um, page for this. Stop presenting. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so um, if we go to the RDS console, Good to see, good to see in a timeout error there. So um, in Amazon Web Services, I'm in the console. Um, I'm gonna go to services down here under the database. I'm gonna click on RDS. Um, 
just have a little check at the time. Okay, yeah. So um, to create a new um, serverless database, I, I come in here to databases and I click this orange create databases button. Um, and close the pop-ups. So um, these are the, this is all of the databases and all of the different modes of operation in this console, Amazon's, or all of the relational databases that Amazon currently kind of provides. So um, we're going to we're going to use the standard create method so I can show you all of the different details. Um, I'm going to show you um, Amazon. Uh, we're going to work on Amazon Aurora. So um, if you were to click Postgres, then you'd get a, sort of a single uh, relational database instance. That's not what we want. We're going to use the Aurora engine. And then down here, we're going to click on um, Amazon Aurora with PostgreSQL compatibility. Um, this pop-up box on the right is quite important over here because it's shown that the only version of Postgres that's currently available with the serverless mode is 10.7. So we have to select that from the drop-down so that we can get our serverless workflow for the rest of the setup. Um, so database features, um, are we going to go for serverless mode because we want this to scale in demand and this is where we start to get to some more interesting things. Um, we can give the database an identifier, plus 4G, um, we can have a, a default username, we can ask Amazon to set us a password, etc. Um, so capacity settings are where it starts to get interesting. So in this current configuration I'm saying that the minimum number of compute units um, is two and that, that's what that is the minimum and um, so we'll leave that as but the maximum is all, all the way up to uh, 384 um, Aurora capacity units, which is um, giving you six, 768 gigabytes of RAM across all of those compute units to perform queries, which is kind of an insane amount um, of memory to use. So we're going to set that to something more reasonable. And what's going to happen there is as we, um, as we uh, perform a number of uh, queries on the database, as the number of connections increases, um, Aurora is going to scale um, the compute units um, to meet that. To, to meet the demand um, between two and eight. And there's a couple of interesting options down here. Um, we can um, force scaling the capacity um, when a timeout is reached. It's quite important if you've got quite um, bursty applications um, and you want to, you don't want to wait for long running queries to finish before scaling. Um, you can force them, force that scaling as soon as possible. Um, and then you can also pause um, your compute capacity after a specific timeout. Um, so here we're saying as there's no one using the database and after five minutes, all of our compute units will um, return to kind of a, a cold state. Um, and so we're not paying for that compute capacity, um, but we'll have, to, um, we'll have to have a little, there'll be a little lag um, when we first make that, um, uh, when we first make that, make that first call. So um, you can kind of play around with that as you need. Um, connectivity, we're going to use the default virtual private cloud. A virtual private cloud um, in Amazon speak is some space within Amazon um, Web Services. It's just for you and just for your services and that only you can access. I'll leave that as the default. Um, there's a few other options down here. We've got um, encryption by default and um, deletion protection. So if we were to click on this orange button, button we'd go away now and, and make a cup of tea and come back in about 10 minutes and we'd have a, a freshly minted database waiting for us to connect. Um, for those of you in the UK that watched um, Blue Peter as a child, here's one I made earlier um, for the interest of time. So I created a database, uh, a serverless database called Demo. So if we click on that, um, we can see some information about the database. Um, we can see its endpoint within the VPC. Um, and I'll we'll actually dig into looking at the monitoring shortly. But I just want to flick back and talk a little bit about how we access the database once we've created it. Um, so Let's make that full screen. So there's, there's really, <clears throat> you've got your database and it's sat within its security group and it's sat within a virtual private cloud. Now, normally in Amazon, um, you can punch a hole in your VPC to access resources that are inside it, but you can't do that with um, a post, an Aura or a Postgres um, serverless database. You have to have some other entity sat here in the VPC that connects through to the database for you. Um, the, the ways that we've tried it, we can have a little EC2, a virtual server that sits in here and we can SSH in um, and use that as a, as a proxy effectively. That's something that we do day to day at Address Cloud. Um, you can use this data API, which is quite an exciting innovation, which is a, a HTTP REST interface um, into Postgres. Um, that means you can make queries without managing a connection pool. And we'll look at that as well. And you can do that from other Amazon tech that's outside the VPC. Um, you can use AppStream, which is actually what we're going to do in a minute. Um, hats off to the guys from Aston um, who demoed this at Edinburgh last year, where you can use AppStream. You set up a virtual machine, a Windows virtual machine, and I'm running QGIS, um, and I'm going to connect through remote desktop, and that, that's that here. Um, and I think there's probably other options using other Amazon tooling, like their VPN service or Direct Connect, but it's not something we've investigated yet. 
So we've created our database. I'm going to show you a really quick demo of how easy it is to, to um, connect to it. Um, I've got, I'm on a web, web browser and I've got um, QGIS running on a remote desktop. So um, here's our QGIS running on our remote server adjacent to our database. So um, I click on the uh, data source manager, Postgres, and we're going to create a new connection. Um, I'm going to kind of call it demo. And then the host um, property for this is this endpoint, um, which is available in the console. Um, so we're going to paste that across. And um, the database is Postgres. Um, SSL mode to prefer. Um, and Amazon can actually store the password for your database for you, which is quite handy, um, particularly if you're connecting programmatically. Um, I didn't want to click that. Let's um, go back here and click test. So great, so the connection to demo is successful. So we're going to go ahead and connect to that and put the credentials in again. So we'll check the time, okay. Um, so that's just going away and thinking and, and just having a read of all the different schemas that are available in that database. Um, and there we go. So we've got public schema and um, we've got a table in uh, called London. And that table, we're going to add that now. Um, that table has um, all of the building footprints for um, at what most of Greater London, it's about 3.9 million um, buildings in it. Um, sorry, my um, Mac keyboard has uh, stopped working. There we go. Okay. So we should start to see if we close this now, we should start to see some buildings rendering in the background. There we go. Um, go away. To, yeah, so there's buildings rendering um, in the background. There's are all sat in our database. Um, so it's just like Postgres, Post, just like Postgres, just like PostGIS. Um, I can run spatial queries on this now, but it's serverless. And so as I make more queries, um, what you'll see is if we go back to the console, um, if we go to logs and events and monitoring, then we can actually get a nice little graph of the um, capacity of the database. So how many of those compute units are running at the time? what the CPU utilization is looking like. And you can see this, this kind of correlation as the number of connections go up as the CPU usage goes up, um, the capacity is scaled by Aurora um, to, meet, to meet that demand. So I'm gonna jump back to my slides after that very brief demo. Um, and uh, yeah, and then just talk about the data API. And this is really the last couple of slides um, and the last little demo for the session um, before we dive into questions. But the data API, I think, is really important um, and it's something worth considering. Um, particularly if you're building um, a geospatial web application, you need to serve data to your users. Because what it allows you to do is instead of managing a, a pool of connections, um, you can actually send your SQL queries via HTTP um, to Aurora um, and then you, you wait for the, for the data to come back. So it's perfect when you've got um, a compute environment like AWS Lambda that's stateless where it's um, a bit tricky to manage um, a connection pool. There are ways that you can do it but it's not particularly efficient. Um, Amazon also has um, a proxy layer that you can use for non-serverless databases to do something similar that's, that's worth looking at. Um, but the, the, uh, the data API is, um, is fantastic and we're, we're using it in production now to serve out, to query and serve out our vector data. Um, you can there's support for it in Python, there's support for it in JavaScript. Um, there's a, an example library from Jeremy Daly there that's very good that, that we use um, that's worth, worth checking out. So, um, yeah, without further ado, we're going to um, have a look at a demonstration where I'm serving um, vector tiles from the database using the data API. So what I'm doing here is um, I've shamelessly copied um, all of Paul, some code, code from Paul Ramsey called Minimal MVT, which um, uh, uses um, PostGIS's uh, MVT functions to create Mapbox vector tiles. Um, and so instead of running a server, a web server to do that, I'm, I'm running those queries using a Lambda um, in response to um, events from an, an API gateway instance. That's an API um, that Amazon's hosting for us. It's sat listening to those requests for tiles. Every time I request a tile, the Lambda um, checks the, the uh, geometry of um, that it's, the, you know, the location that's required for that tile, what's required. Um, requests that from the database um, and then returns that to the browser. So if I can escape my presentation um, before the summary slide, we can have a little look at, look at this in operation. So um, the, 
The code is available at um, github.com forward slash address cloud forward slash minimal MVT. And I'm, I'm not really doing anything clever here. This is just um, a really quick kind of um, silly example. We probably wouldn't do this in production in this exact con configuration because there's no caching available here. Um, so as I zoom out, every time I move the map, um, you can see all of my building polygons from my data set um, are all being um, queried against the database in real time. And this is a really good way to melt your database and, and break it really fast because particularly as I start to zoom out and ask for more tiles, um, each one of those tiles is probably an individual query, which is an individual lambda. So I'm going to just pan around and expect this to break um, any second. If I was to do this in production, um, you, you definitely want some kind of cloud front caching um, across the top of this. Um, we actually generate um, static um, vector tiles, particularly for data sets like this that aren't moving um, or there's no real time updates needed. You know, these buildings aren't changing that frequently. Um, we, we could just cache these um, in an SV bucket. But um, for, for data that's, um, that, that's live or dynamic, um, I think this is quite exciting because it means you can have an entirely serverless stack um, that's, that's changing in real time. For example, um, in the US, um, our mapping tool allows you to see stream gauges um, as, a, as a sort of flood flood likelihood indicator and that data is changing hourly. So you can see that we could be using this to do um, vector tiles of that data rather than dealing with GeoJSON. So I think it's quite exciting. If we flip back to the console, what we might start to see now is, um, there's a little bit of latency here, but we might start to see our CPU usage um, creeping up and um, our database connection count um, increasing as well. Um, so I'm going to dive back to the slides for a summary and then, and then that's it from me um, and I'm happy to take questions. But let's just, yeah, there's a couple of important points to just uh, wrap up with here. I um, appreciate that that was a whistle stop tour and um, somewhere between a presentation and a sort of demo. But I hope it was useful to some of you. Um, so great that we were kind of talking about this at the last Phosphor G um, and now we've started using it. And I think that um, the opportunities for the geospatial community to take use, to make use of serverless applications and serverless data stores is, is really great. Um, uh, yeah, using, um, using Postgres uh, was really like how, how to deal with spatial data in Postgres in a serverless way was really the last kind of problem to solve. Um, we've used it in production for six months. Um, uh, we've, in that time, we've had about 800 queries against the database. Um, we've scaled about five, we've seen scaling about five times in response to high CPU load. Um, probably by us loading data in and also running some large queries. Um, the largest um, duration um, for scaling was about 35 minutes, and then it scaled up down again. And customer latency of our service wasn't affected during that time. So we didn't see that that scaling had affected. There was no one waiting for that scaling to happen before the query completed. Um, the only um, issue that we have had in February, when we, just a month after we started using this, um, we had a, a four minute outage um, of the service. The way that Aurora Serverless works is, um, the compute units are all in one, what's called an availability zone, which is effectively a data center in Amazon, Amazon speak. Now the data itself and that data layer, thinking back to that diagram at the beginning is, is um, sharded effectively across many data centers. Um, so the data is completely safe, but the compute only resides in one availability zone at a time. And what happened is that the data center for whatever reason lost connectivity or there was a hardware failure. Um, we haven't had this confirmed by Amazon that effectively the servers that were running Postgres at that time went down. And so um, they had to be, the data was there already, but their compute had to be moved over, reassigned to another um, uh, availability zone, another data center. And, and that happened automatically. So the database self healed. So that was quite impressive. So within four minutes, we were back up. So I think it's worth considering our application. Um, we're not bound by an SLA to our customers for this component of our application. So we're happy with the, um, with the trade-offs that we get and um, being able to meet that spiky, spiky demand. Um, I think if you do have SLAs, then it's worth looking at the non-serverless version of Aurora um, and also potentially the, the, the traditional um, relational database service RDS with the new um, proxy layer over the top. Um, so that's it from me. I hope that's been useful and thanks very much for your time. Great. Thank you, Thomas. Um, we've got uh... Uh, a few questions actually. So um, from the top, I've got a question from, apologies if I pronounce the name wrong, uh, Faisan, um, asking if you, did you undertake research around options for data storage, including but not limited to Elasticsearch brackets, geospatial capabilities? Yes, we are big users of Elasticsearch. So, um, uh, of those, uh, yeah, of the million, you know, the 10 million queries that we do a month or 10, 10 million requests, 
um, that uh, is moving into our API and then it's going to different systems. So PostGIS is actually probably the um, data store that receives the fewest number of um, queries. Um, we, we've got data in um, Amazon's DynamoDB, um, we've got data in Elasticsearch, and then we also, for our raster data, I've spoken about this possible the last couple of years, um, we're using cogs that are stored in, in S3 and we're doing um, indexing them um, using all the stuff from Cloud Optimized GeoTips and the querying them that way. So yeah, it's, this is just one of our data stores, um, but it was really the last one um, that we needed to try and work out how it was gonna be scalable. So even though it's the smallest number of queries, um, it's for those really, they're really complicated um, and we, we really wanted to be able to provide this functionality to the customer. Cool, okay. Um, so then I've got a question from Dennis asking, um, could you explain um, I think this is relating to the import of data. You said it was a slow process importing data from other systems, and um, so he was just asking how you how you solve that. Hi, Dennis. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, in other, uh, so in either Amazon Aurora non-serverless uh, and also RDS, you can normally um, take an existing database and, and make a, um, a snapshot, an image of, of the database, and then restore that to a new database cluster. That's not currently available in serverless um, mode, so we, we effectively just have to um, stream it from one database to another. Um, there's no there's no snapshot restore functionality from RDS to Aurora Serverless at the moment. So depending on your file size, that might be a blocker. So not all of our data not all of our data that's in Postgres is stored in Aurora Serverless. We still do have a traditional RDS that we use for development um, in the team. Um, that's kind of our, our data store, but we are looking at moving that over. Um, but there's no, yeah, there's no, there's no quick way of doing it. Um, the data loading itself isn't particularly slow. Raw is very fast, but you just have to do it just like you'd be loading any other data in. Um, I think. Hope that answers the question. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, so uh, we've got two people have asked if you can um, give any information about the cost of this service um, and. Jez basically says, could you choose between tiny, medium, and eye-watering for the costs? Uh, no, so you don't have any control over it. You just have, you can just um, choose between how, how big you want the database to get in response to the number of requests. So you can say- but, I mean, have, have those costs been tiny, medium, or eye-watering too? Yeah. Uh, those, yeah, those costs haven't been any, any more than us would if we were provisioning this with RDS. I can't remember the pricing. I would go to the Amazon Docs, um, it, the pricing is on their website. Um, this hasn't been, this is not um, particularly expensive for us. Um, it's not, we not, didn't go, wow, that's expensive. Um, I think if we were to provision RDS instances at the capacity to deal with those spikes that we've seen, um, it, would be, it would be more expensive because they would be on all the time or we'd be having to try and spend time kind of managing that um, ourselves, which is, is obviously a cost associated there. So I think the costs of um, the service itself aren't, um, they're not astronomical um, and also it allows me to sleep at night um, so you can't put a price on that. Yeah okay so the final question then um, from Paul he says um, that he's told that the data API has a one megabyte size limit for requests. Um, has that ever caused issues e.g. when trying to retrieve extremely large polygons um, that actually you know where possibly a single a single record might actually exceed that limit? Um, and if you have had that problem, have you got any tips on how to, to deal with it? Uh, yeah, that's totally a valid um, constraint. Um, and it's not one that we face, just, but just because of the way our, our systems are architected, we're not returning um, geometry, um, we're returning um, some attributes. So we're returning, for example, a flood score or a crime score for that, for that polygon. Um, so we're performing that spatial query in the database, but then returning some attribute data. So it, it tends to be tiny. So we haven't hit that problem. I've seen other people talking about it. So there is... It's a restriction to be aware of. Um, I don't know of any way around it currently. Okay, and the final question um, from uh, Matt DeBont. He says, do you have a feeling for the time for scaling up from a cold start, e.g. a cluster has paused after no activity? Um, he's got a lot of niche use cases, so he wouldn't be seeing a lot of traffic outside of office hours. Um, so he, you know, but he's after some ideas, some kind of figures on the cold starts. Yeah, somewhere between 10 and 60 seconds. Um, I think that's what the official sort of docs say. Um, it, it, it is getting faster. I uh, uh, met with um, 
some of the people from the Amazon Postgres uh, Aurora team um, last year um, at an AWS event, and so that they are they've done a lot of work on making it faster, um, which is good. Yep. There's also I think there's there's different temperatures of uh, coldness, um, if that kind of makes sense. There's there's really cold after you not touch the database for a weekend, um, then it, yeah you're looking at you're going to look at a minute to get something, uh, maybe maybe more like thirty seconds. And there's, I haven't used it in the last hour, um, which is going to be more like 10 seconds. So it's really something to have for your application in case. It's really for something to have a play around with and just, just try it out. Um, our application is fairly fault tolerant. We can do things like make a second request if we, if we do hit a cold start, depending on, on what we're doing. So it, I think um, best advice there is to give it a go. Grant. Um